Dear Madam President, let me bring to light for your assessment. In February 2005, Sultan Kudrat journalist Marlene Esperat wrote a letter to then President Gloria Arroyo, exposing anomalies in the Department of Agriculture. Marlene had hoped for support from the country's highest official in her crusade against corruption. The letter to the president was her last resort. It would also be her last act. A month later, Marlene was dead, murdered by a gunman in her own home. I am falsely accused without proof. A year later, President Gloria Arroyo herself was linked to anomalies in the Department of Agriculture, the very same anomalies that Marlene Esperat had been trying to expose. Marlene Esperat started out as a chemist with the regional office of the Department of Agriculture, then based in Strife Torn, Maguindanao Province. Here in a small laboratory, away from the seat of power that is Manila, evidence of graft unfolded before her eyes. And they loomed larger, the longer and harder she looked, forming a network of complicity that engulfed her agency and beyond. In the early 90s, Marlene uncovered financial reports saying her laboratory had an annual allotment of 400,000 pesos, even though she got only half of that amount. Also, there was a budget to repair her laboratory but was never used for that purpose. Yung hiningi niya na 1 million daw sa DBM for the purpose of the renovating her laboratory. Numating ako, pero nagalaw yun ang sabi niya so tiningnan ko rin as a koa tiningnan ko tama nga namunot the incident prompted an investigation by the department of agriculture office in manila but fire broke out at the regional office while the probe was underway witnesses would later accuse two ranking officials as responsible for burning down the office to destroy the evidence regional finance officer osmenia montanier and accountant estrelita sabay it would not be the first time marlene's fate would cross swords with sabay and montanier Marlene was placed under the Government Witness Protection Program and assigned to work with the Agriculture Department's resident ombudsman in Quezon City. Here, she proved tireless and fearless, uncovering more evidence of graft and corruption in her department. She exposed the illegal importation of chicken by one company owned by a congressman, filing a complaint against then-agriculture undersecretary Cesar Drilon and then-Surigao congressman Prospero Pichay. She also found evidence of other anomalies, from the overpriced purchases of speedboats to ghost irrigation projects in the countryside. Marlene kept up her fight, gathering documents and filing graft complaints before the ombudsman. Feeling the growing heat, Marlene left the agriculture department in 2004, hoping to start a new life as a wife, mother, and storekeeper. But her passion against corruption led her to a different forum. Marlene started a column for a weekly newspaper in Sultan Kudarat and anchored a regular radio program in the same province. From these media platforms, she continued to hunt corrupt officials of the agriculture department. Mga malalaking tao na ginawaanan niya ng ano, so sabi ko marami, doon marami ng kalaban natin. Because hindi tayo kaibigan ninyan, kakalabanin tayo niyan. But Marlene's biggest expose was yet to come. In 2004, Marlene accused two very senior agriculture officials of causing the overpriced purchase of 700 million pesos of fertilizers. Then National Food Authority Administrator Arthur Yap and Agriculture Undersecretary Joselin Jokjok Bolante, a known associate of First Gentleman Mike Arroyo, the husband of President Arroyo. Marlene's exposés touched off a firestorm. For the first time, Marlene was implicating national government officials, some of whom were very close allies of the first family. Marlene knew her life was in peril, so in February 2005, she personally wrote President Arroyo about the growing threats to her life. Lately, reports reveal that military intelligence operatives were allegedly out and tasked to liquidate the undersigned to silence her forever. A month later, on March 24, 2005, a man walked into Marlene's home and shot her in the head while her family was having dinner. Kevin was 13 when he saw his mother killed right in their own home. Kumakain po kami sa sa magsigilid po ng tindahan namin. Bumili yung bumaril ng sigarilyo tapos uh, nag-greet pa po siya ng magandang gabi po ma'am. Tapos binaril ka agad sa ulo. O oh, isang bala lang po, isang baril lang po. Tapos umalis na kaagad siya. It was doubly tragic for Rinchi, Marlene's daughter from a previous marriage. 
Her father, Rino Arcones of Bombo Radio Iloilo, was also murdered in 1989. She believes Marlene had taken on the crusade of her father so that they can grow up in a better world. Kasi ma'am, parang naglaki kami na wala siya. Andiyan siya, but physically andiyan siya. Pero parang yung, yung attention niya wala. Parang ganun. Pero alam namin, ina-explain din niya na yung ginagawa niya para din sa amin in the future. Kung mari, total niya na-stop yung pagka-journalist niya. Hindi naman pwede kasi may prinsipyo nga sila, pangalawa. Eh, hindi naman daw siya takot mamatay. Journalists are not supposed to die simply because they deliver news. Journalist lawyer Prima Kinsayas is a private prosecutor in the Esperat murder case. She notes with alarm how more and more local journalists are getting killed because of the stories that they write. How important do we think is that piece of news that it must reach the public? But that's just it. Even the fact that we are talking about and we are dwelling on that question makes it wrong. Because no journalist should be killed for a piece of story. And therefore we go back again to that culture of impunity. No? Malu Manar knows this problem firsthand. Malu was a radio journalist based in Cotabato City. A colleague of Marlene, she took part in Marlene's crusade against graft in the regional office of the Agriculture Department. And she too received death threats for her crusade. After Marlene's murder, Malu was forced to accept the assignment to a sister station, 110 kilometers away from Cotabato, just so she would be safe and live to write another day. Eh, hindi lang to basta trabaho lang. Hindi lang to basta pera lang. Yung, yung pagtatrabaho bilang journalist, ano to, eh, kaakibat dito yung gusto mong mangyari na lumitaw yung katotohanan talaga. At kung sino man yung may sala, dapat maparusahan. Authorities got a major breakthrough two weeks after Marlene's murder when the man who acted as a lookout surrendered to the police. This led to the arrest of three other men who all confessed to participating in the murder of Marlene. In October 2006, 18 months after the murder, a Cebu court handed a guilty verdict on Marlene's killers. Gunman Jerry Cabayag, lookout Randy Grecia, and getaway vehicle driver June Bismanos. A fourth accused who turned state witness, military intelligence officer Rowi Barua, was acquitted. He testified that he hired the killers on orders of Osmeña Montanier and Estrelita Sabay, the two Department of Agriculture officials that Marlene had previously accused of graft. Curiously, the courts believed the gunmen when they confessed to the murder, but refused to believe them when they identified the masterminds. For the next five years, Sabay and Montagnier, both mid-level bureaucrats, succeeded in throwing all kinds of legal obstacles against the case. This is even though the convicted gunmen had already identified them positively as the ones who hired them for the murder. The trial venue for Sabay and Montagnier had to be transferred three times to three different cities because the defense had questioned the impartiality of the courts. For six years, the alleged masterminds managed to slow down the wheels of justice further and in their favor leading some to suspect that there were other, more senior people involved in the case. When you look at the rules of court, there is no number of, let's say, motions that you can file. You can just keep filing motion after motion after motion. There is no limit to it. I've discovered that when an accused is well off or considerably well off, um, he or she can maximize, make use, explore, all remedies available under the law and allowed under the rules of court. The courts had also issued three arrest warrants against the two, but on all occasions, the alleged masterminds eluded arrest. And more recently, the Court of Appeals granted an injunction order against their latest arrest warrant. So after years of evading valid arrest warrants, the two officials are now back at work, as if they had never been on the run. The Department of Agriculture Information Office in Coronadal confirmed this to the PCIJ. Charlie Garcia is Marlene's brother and spiritual advisor. He recalls that Marlene almost went on a scholarship abroad through the help of a congressman who wanted her to cool off for a while. But one of the legislators that Marlene had implicated in one of her exposés reportedly blocked this plan. Charlie quoted Marlene as saying to him, Isang congressman ang nagsuggest. Uh, sabi niya, why are you worrying much of that spirit? Hindi naman masyadong ano yan, importante yan eh. The silent hair. If you cannot silent hair, you could silent hair forever. Hindi, hindi makakaubos ng 120,000 yan. Yun ang nag-trigger talaga sa kanya na ihan nun yung letter niya to the President. Madam President, please spare the food department so it can sustain your people. I am ready to die for this cause.
the fertilizer fund scam that Marlene had exposed turned out bigger than she had ever expected. The overpricing of the fertilizers was allegedly used to fund the 2004 election campaign of administration candidates, led by President Gloria Arroyo, the same person Marlene had sought help from. Former Agriculture Undersecretary Joselin Volante fled to the U.S. after the scandal broke. He was eventually arrested in the United States and deported back to Manila. But during a grilling before the Senate, Volante was defended by legislators from the administration party of President Arroyo. In the 2010 elections, Bulante ran for governor of Capiz province and lost. Bulante's former boss, Agriculture Secretary Luis Lorenzo, denied knowing anything about the funds. His brother Martin later contributed 20 million pesos to the 2010 election campaign of now President Benigno Aquino III. Former National Food Authority Chief Arthur Yap has reinvented himself by winning a seat in Congress representing a district in Bohol province. And former President Gloria Arroyo, whose election campaign in 2004 has reportedly been propped up by the fertilizer funds, ran and won a seat in the new Congress in May 2010, granting her immunity from prosecution for now. The resolution of Marlene's murder case, like the cases she filed against corrupt officials, appear so near, yet ever so far and elusive, six years after her death. Nung nilabas niya itong fertilizer scam, binigyan naman siya ng full support ng government, pati ang media. Pumatay niya, dandahan, marating dito yung mga kaso niya, bumabalik dito, address sa kanya, but ang laman noon, all dismissal of the case. If there's anything that you have to laud her for, it's that she actually believed in our justice system. Yes. Right? to actually file cases before the office of the Ombudsman. Marlene Esperat died believing in the justice system, a system that has yet to lend meaning to all that she fought and died for.